All right, as we know, we have uh, 60 more slides to go. So target is like, what, 8 p.m.? No, I don't think so. We, need, we all need to go home, right? Because uh, the Premier League new season has already begun. And we got to go back and watch football. <laughs> but my team doesn't play, so I'm fine. I can stay to 9 p.m. maybe. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, I think the most important thing is just to get the idea how we can approximate the, the flexural members. So neck is just, you know, more of the same, but for non-compact. Uh, web section. And uh, the, 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 the major difference that you have here is the factor to reduce the strength of the section because you now have non-compact web. So instead of going to MP, you have RPC multiplied by MY instead. So the basic idea is that is that now you have RPC here and here, but uh, for this is the same for the flange local buckling. Okay, so if 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 we understand the behavior of the buckling of the flange of the beam, it doesn't matter whether you have the compact web section or non-compact web. You just check the the flange and then you calculate according to the slenderness ratio of the flange here, because the 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 overall behavior here is just the same. And likewise for the lateral torsional buckling, it's just that you have different sets of formula. This time you have RPC multiplied by MY instead of having MP. Okay? And now you have RPC here and here as well, and then that's it. And RPC itself, you can see that if Say, if, if we have the compact web, this term will be gone. Right, so you have MP over MY, which is a shape factor. So if you multiply RPC when I it is equal to MP over MY, you get MP. Right? So that means. The, when you have the non-compact web section, you have the beam that is stronger than a typical beam because the RPC should be greater than 1, but it's not MP. So it's somewhere between MP and MY. Okay? And you will only have this with the build-up section. So you... it's. You know, it, when, when I was a student in the U.S., they, don't, they didn't have this. And I, when I, I had to calculate some flexural strength, I got to derive all the formulas for myself. And after that, the formulas became available. Okay? And this is something in between. If you don't have the slender web, if you don't have the compact web, you're in here. And this is the definition of the H, H0, and D for the calculation of those. Now you will be more familiar with this one. The slender web section. Uh, any of you here are familiar with plate girder? Not very friendly uh, look. But, you know, I remember the, the engineering council of Thailand wanted plate girder to be taught in the undergrad class. And so, you know, I, I, I used to teach a play girder for the graduate level, and it, it generally uh, takes me like two to three weeks to teach how to design one play girder. And they want to squeeze that in the undergrad level. Crazy, to say the least. It's impossible because the, the calculation is long. It's not difficult, but it takes time. So when, when you want to squeeze too much too soon in a limited time, you end up giving a bad impression to students that this is something you could never understand in your entire life. You'd rather not teach it than just to, to, to send out the wrong message. Because for me, if you have the play girder, it's just the beam with slender web and we have a punishment in terms of RPG, that's it. So when you calculate the strength, it's just you know, MY multiplied by one factor. And you see the form, the rest, it's just the same. 
But now the punishment for the plagiarism is very, very huge. You see, you remember MR before, it's 70%, right? It's 0.7 FY multiplied by SX. Here is 0.3. Because they're so afraid of the, the effect of the residual stress because this is built up section. And uh, here is multiplied by the plus, uh, sorry, the elastic section modulus. And then the rest of the form is pretty much the same. And likewise for lateral torsional buckling, it's the same here. At, uh, oh, it's <laughs> uh, we have the cursor here, the RPG multiplied by MY, and then if it's lateral torsional buckling, you have the help from CB, which you should use, and then the punishment by RPG, and here as well, RPG and CB. And this time, unlike uh, RPC before, for the slender web, RPG should generally be less than one. It cannot be greater than one because that means you increase the strength of the beam. Okay? And this is the very, very old uh, formula. The RPG is like this. And if you can recall, this is the limit lambda r for the web. Okay? So that means if you have a plate girder, the slenderness ratio of your web should always be greater than 5.7 square root uh, E over Fy. Right? If your slenderness ratio is less than this number, this parenthesis will give you the negative number. Correct? If this is less than that, this becomes negative. And negative, and negative, that becomes positive. And so you can have RPG greater than 1, which is wrong. You can't, right? And that's probably one of the reasons why I sort of stopped teaching graduate students, because some of them could just come up with RPG greater than 1. And I think it's okay if you're an undergrad student and make mistakes like that. It's forgivable in one way. But if you become a graduate student and you still make a mistake like that, what's the point? Right? And LP and LR becomes uh, simpler for the calculation. And then that's it. Okay? <clears throat> and uh, I still have a few more. When you have the next one is bending in minor axis or in Y axis of an edge. When you use the beam in this direction, ladies and gentlemen, If you use the beam in this direction, you know, your strong axis is now in this direction, right? So it can't twist because this becomes your strong axis and your beam is going to bend down like this. This is your, your bending axis, right? So your beam cannot twist in the x axis because this is a strong axis. And that is why if you have minor axis bending lateral torsional buckling cannot occur because your beam cannot twist. But it's not a good idea to use the beam like this because it's not strong at all in this axis, right? It's not strong at all. So if you think, ah, I'd rather use the beam like this because I don't have lateral torsional buckling problem, yeah, well, you don't, but you're not going to have a lot of load carrying capacity as well. Right? So, let's uh, come back uh, here. It means that when you, when you check your minor axis bending, you only need to worry about flange local buckling. And the formula is uh, pretty similar to what we had before. Okay? Now, okay? If we have a square and uh, rectangular hollow steel section, you know, it, I was, n I went, a little crazy because I don't know the difference between square and rectangular hollow steel section and box section. Do you know what the difference? I, I, I remember 
sending a message to Ajahn Sutat asking, what the heck is this? So square is not box. Rectangle, rectangular section is not a box. It is, right? <laughs> it is. But the thing is this. This is the, the steel section that they, they sort of, uh, you know, fold uh, the steel to form the section. This is build up section where you weld the plates together to form a box. Crazy. Uh, but, but once you know, this is, this is how they call, how they use the name to define a section. So when we know it, it's fine, right? Not, not, nothing serious about it. And yeah, for if you have the square or rectangular hollow steel section, you check French local buckling based on these three. And when you have the box section, you're going to need to calculate the effective uh, elastic section modulus when you have the problem with the buckling. With that. Oh, I, I mean, yeah, you check, uh, th they are the same. Sorry, my, my mistake. For, for all these sections, we have the same, but you need to recalculate the effective uh, elastic section modulus based on these two formulas. This one is for square and rectangular, and the last one is for box section. Kind of crazy. Okay. And web local buckling is this one. It's just formulas and formulas now. Okay. But now, here's the catch. Again, I discovered this uh, before, but now they fix it. Before this, they said, if you have the square and rectangular uh, hollow steel section, no need to worry about lateral torsional buckling. But <coughs> AISI, which is another group, say you need to consider lateral torsional buckling. So AISC and AISI said two different things. This is not nice. I plan to publish something about it, but then they fix it. So that's good. I don't have to do anything about it anymore. The funny thing is my advisor is in both sets of committees. <laughs> so he must, he must have known this. So right now, you need to check lateral torsional buckling of these uh, section as well based on this. But chances are it is highly unlikely that it will govern because the LP I think LP and LR, when you calculate it, is very, very, very large. So, even if you calculate it, chances are it's not going to govern our design anyway. Okay? Now, this is uh, for the round shape and so on. I don't know about this. I have never done it myself, but if you have to calculate the round hollow steel section under bending moment, this is how you do it. Okay? Now, uh, I think this is uh, far-fetched, so I, I just include that because you will need to consider this when you have uh, connections. I may come to uh, this uh, tomorrow, but then right now, right now, let's skip it. It's just a uh, proportion for design the play girder, okay? Let's just skip it for the time being. Okay, so b before we go into the shear, let's uh, sum it up again the difference between the OASD and uh, the present uh, specification. Of course, the ASD 89, as I mentioned, they use elastic section modulus, but they modify the allowable stress. But right now, we use the true plastic section modulus. And again here, the old one has a problem with the unit, but the new one, we have the unitless uh, formula, okay? which is easier. And the flexural strength, this is a flange local buckling. The OSD just gives you one formula. But right now, we have a very clear set of formulas for uh, predicting the behavior of uh, flange local buckling. Okay, And that is the OASD one that we already made fun of a little bit in the morning session. And this is the common one, you know, with a clear picture. And, oh, I haven't mentioned about the CB, right? This is the old CB calculation in ASD89, rather confusing. This is the, 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 the present one. 
And since I don't have uh, it anywhere, let me show it to you right now. <coughs> CB is the number for one unbraced length, not for the entire beam. Okay, so if you have time to change the color, it's uh, getting boring, right? Let's say if you have a beam like this, and your bending moment diagram looks like that, and then I have this as my LB, unbraced length. I want to calculate the strength of this region. I need to calculate CB based on this. So I'm going to use this moment diagram. How can I draw something that crazy? OK. I'm going to use this shape to calculate my bending moment, uh, my CB. I'm sorry. And uh, according to the definition, we have M max. M max is there. No doubt about that. And then we have MA, MB, and then MC in the formula. MA, MB, and MC are the values at the quarter point. That means we divide this portion into four equal uh, spaces. And then MA is the value there. MB is the value there, and MC is the value there. And that is LB over 4, LB over 4, LB over 4, and then LB over 4. Okay? The M max can be anywhere. It's just the maximum value of bending moment of that particular unbraced length. Now, one more thing is that if you have the bending moment diagram that looks like this, ooh la la, which one is greater? I just happen to draw it equally. Oh, that's four lines, right? So the M max is there, and then again, M, that should be MB, at the quarter point, that should be MA. And that should be perhaps MC. Use positive values or absolute values at all times. So that means in the calculation of CB, you use this positive value. Don't need to use a negative value. And this is also positive in the calculation of CB. OK? use absolute value, so to speak. And you're going to have a large number of CB when you have the moment diagram that looks like that, because your beer will become much harder to buckle. All right, not so bad. Uh, we are halfway through the slide now. Right? We have a, like, less than 40 slides left. <coughs> okay, so we, we're done here. Oh, that, that's a formula. Now, shear. Okay, the last topic for today. Shear force. Von Mies, right? So, you know, what is it about it? Shear, shear is actually a very complicated thing, you know? What is that formula? Can I use that? That's the force divided by the area, right? What about the VQ over IB formula? Oh, which one is right? What should we do? What should we do? Why did I write this? This is the direct shear, right? Force divided by the area. So what about the VQ over IB formula? What kind of shear is that? <laughs> That's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I probably didn't know it myself if I if I ha- hadn't taught it like for 12 years or so. But I should have known, right? Because at least I got as f- to the f- the f- the farthest way t- to get the degree from the U- U.S. of A. So the flexural shear is VQ over IB. That is called a flexural shear, right? It's a shear that comes with bending moment. We all had mechanics or materials class before, right? So don't tell me you don't know flexural shear. Because when you bend something, you can shear it off at the same time. So that VQ over IB comes from the fact that the stress is not equal, so each layer can be sheared off. <coughs> and in the beam, we generally have the flexural shear, right? So how come I have the direct shear here? Do you know that? I bet if you know, you have completely forgotten about it. As if you had never come across it before in your life. But the thing is that, of course, the stress is always VQ over IB. But when you have the edge like this, and you use VQ over IB formula, the stress distribution will look like this, ladies and gentlemen. Right? Because here, this is B. And that, that becomes your B. So the stress looks like that. And when the stress looks like this, the majority of the shear is carried by the web. So that means I can use the average value just like that. And it's pretty much similar to V over D and TW, somewhat close to direct shear. And that is why I could write it like that in my slide. So it's just like a blessing. Oh, you, we don't have to, you, to calculate VQ over IB in the, in the steel beam, right? Good. Right? One problem has been taken care of. And based on that, ladies and gentlemen, we can easily approximate the shear strength of our section by multiplying the uh, shear strength with the shear area, D over TW, uh, D multiplied by TW. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the area of the entire depth, not the area of the web. Okay? It's D, it's the depth, multiplied by the web thickness. Okay? And then multiply by 0.6 FY. And you see, this is another issue that I always, you know, I have to begin with the approximation of the design because this is the magic number from von Mies. It's 1 over square root 3. But one, 1 over square root 3 is not exactly 0.6. It's 0.57. But they don't care. I use 0.6. They use 0.6. So we use 0.6. So now, you know, it's not 0.6. It's 0.57. So how are you, how are you going to do with, the, with your calculation? Oh, no, I'm going crazy. I can't accept this. I can go back and change every calculation to 0.57. All we need is proper approximation, right? So you have proper approximation. You need not worry about things. <clears throat> I remember it just so happened that uh, last year, I somehow got the exam where the answer is just the, the flexural strength of the member is 1% less than the actual moment in that problem. So I got the, the, the last question to students. Do you think this beam is safe? What should we do about it? Most of them got the, got the calculation correctly up until the end. But then all of them, except one person, say, we need to change the section. It's going to fail. Because the, the 
external moment uh, caused by the load is 1% greater than the design strength of the beam. 1%. It's going to fail for sure. So what about this? 0.6 versus 0.57. Wow, that's like 5%. So we, we overestimate the shear strength by 5%. Is that okay? Is that acceptable? Well, of course it is, right? Why not? And But, well, one thing that comes with the shear, no surprise, is buckling. In general, for hot roll section, we are not going to have the problem with the buckling of the web under shear because I think all of the web in the hot roll section the dimension has been taken care of so you're not going to have the problem with the shear but it will come into our consideration when we have the plate girder remember I mentioned that you don't need to have the thick web because our major uh, concern for the plate girder is moment. So you only need to have the thick flange to create the moment capacity for the beam. The web can be left thin, but then you're going to need to have to take care of the, the buckling of the web under shear, that's all. And to take care of the web buckling under shear is a lot cheaper than to increase the web thickness. Okay? All right. Now, here for the typical uh, section, when we consider the buckling of the web, which is the, the element that carries the shear, we always consider the edge distance. But when we calculate the shear strength of the section, we use the entire depth. Okay? So don't, don't, don't mix that. And after this, of course, the nominal shear strength of the section will be equal to 0.6 Fy multiplied by the shear area, which is uh, generally the depth multiplied by the web thickness. And in this case, you just use only edge distance if you have the square and the rectangular section. And then multiply by this factor to account for buckling of your web under shear. But generally speaking, for the typical web of the hot draw section and, and you know things like this, CV is one. Because the hot draw section will not have web buckling under shear. So that is why we, we don't pay good attention to you know the, the, the design of a shear, shear shear in the steel beam because it rarely is a problem but it will become a big problem with the plate girder. That's all. So, now that we know, uh, if, you want, if you don't want me to go into details about it, that's fine, because if it's just hot roll, there's no problem. And, yeah, one more headache for this is that they have this, and I can easily leave this out of my uh, lecture or presentation just to save the, the problem, but I don't do that. I want you to know everything that is good for you. So here, remember, um, generally there are two limits for the shear. This is the very, very old limit. The H over TW, uh, the, this limit is old. And uh, I have to say that there's another limit here. And KV is generally equal to 5. And when you multiply when you substitute k equal to 5 into this, you're going to get the h over t w uh, less than 2.45 uh, right, square root e over f by. So the first one that you have, and you, you can just look at your, your handout, or your slide, and I'm just going to write here. The old one says h over t w less than 2.24 square root e over f y, right? And then you have that one. Another one is 
1.1 square root kV and then the, uh, the rest is the same. When I substitute kV equal to 5, this becomes 2.45 square root E over F5. Now this is a general limit that will tell you whether or not your web will buckle under shear. So if you don't if you don't mind, you can just check with this limit. Which all hot roll sections will have the edge over Tw below this. And that means Cv1 is equal to 1. But this is the lower value. If you want to use it, and if you check your edge over Tw, and it is also lower than this, because this is lower than that, right? If you check your section and the, this edge over Tw is also lower than that, you are entitled to use factor of safety equal to 1.5 and phi equal to 1. Because in general case, for this case, it's typical. Phi is 1, it's 5 or 3, and phi is 0.9. So it is fine. You can use this. There's nothing wrong. But if you want to go further, which may not be necessary, you can check with that limit and use this. We can increase our shear capacity if we want to. But, you know, as I said before, uh, the shear is not really a problem for steel beams. So you don't have to do this. But it's good to know this because there, there is a history behind it. It's funny. And, and if, if, if you come across me, you should know this. Right? It's just because if you, if you have a lecture with me and you don't know this, it's kind of, you miss the signature sort of thing. Here, phi equal to 1. Wow. Are we so sure about that? Really? We are so sure about the formula? I don't need to reduce anything. I can just use the full calculated strength as my design strength. Is that what it is? Actually, no. It's funny because somehow, I don't know why, but the old ASD 89, they use this factor of safety for shear. They don't use that. I don't know why. But at the beginning of history, when uh, LRFD first became available, they used that. And remember our magic number 1.5? When you multiply the factor of safety with the fee, it must be equal to 1.5. So the OSD has, had that, and the OFD had that. So it, it was an unfair match. So that's why, eh, in order to have the, the, the fair you know, comparison, fee has got to be equal to 1. So it's, for, it's funny. See? See, no matter how good they are, you know, the, the, the engineers in the US, it's something like this always occurs. Because it's just the more work you do, you, you, you tend to make more human error, right? They know it and then they fix it. That is why we have two limits. And that is why fees go to one. Because somehow, in the old days, factor of safety for shear was 1.5. So, you know, now you know a little bit of a history behind the shear. We can just stick with this. That's fine by me. To make life easier. Right? And there's no need to use that. But if you want to use it, it's fine as well. Any question? Crystal clear, right? Again, like I said, the shear should not be a problem for the hot roll section. It will become a concern for play girder only. Ooh, 4.30. Don't worry, 30 slides left. And yeah, I guess so. I'm going to have to crawl back home. <laughs> anyway.
uh, next is because we have this uh, kV. Oh, sorry. Because we have the kV in our limit, so this is how we can calculate kV. So, for a typical case, the, the hot roll section without stiffeners, kV is five. Here, kV is five. And funny how this is the this is a major change from the previous specification. Now, for the hot roll, we have only two limits. Okay, just one limit here, and then two categories. And all the hot roll sections we have H over T W below this limit. So your C V one is equal to one. And the calcul the calculation for the nominal shear strength of your hot roll section is easily 0.6 Fy multiplied by the shear area. Simple as that. Okay. It becomes a little bit of a more problem with the plate girder. Do you are interested in the plate girder? Maybe or maybe not. But plate girder is a, a, a very interesting beast because it says here that somebody did the test. This is from the research that when the web buckles under shear, if we provide enough support on both sides or enough restraint, it can carry on to carry that's bad English. It can carry on, and it means it will not collapse yet. It has the strength after the buckling occurs. That's why they call it post-buckling strength. Post means after. Okay. Post can mean many things. Post is a pole. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. This. Now I'm going to enjoy this later. Okay. Um, but we have to provide enough support. And you can see it becomes something like a truss. Right? And this becomes the uh, compression. So the beam is some kind of a truss in this case because a truss is a form of a beam. Right? So even if after the web buckles, we can still form the tension field here so that your beam becomes a truss. And when you have the stiffeners here, the stiffeners will form a part of a truss. And this is a major thing because we can have a thin plate. We can have a slender web. And when we provide our slender web with enough uh, stiffeners here, the beam will become a truss. And therefore, we don't need to have a thick web. But we need to learn how to utilize this so-called tension field action, which is the post-buckling strength of the web. 